Amen. So if you give me 30 minutes, I'll try to get you out in half an hour, okay? Today is uh, health day, and I'm sure you see the lovely fruit and vegetables. Uh, one day this week, I, in conversation with my wife, she said, I, I feel like I can eat a mango. Well, I see mangoes here. So, I mean, you guys can take everything else, but you got to leave at least one mango for the preacher. When I take it home today, she is going to be elated. So I said, you have an urge for mango? Are you pregnant? <laughs> when my wife was pregnant with, uh, with my son, I, I, I see my son walked in, uh, sitting on the back pew today, when uh, she was pregnant with him. She woke up one day and she said to me, she said, uh, I don't know, you have to go find me a piece of beef. Beef? Because uh, at our house, we generally don't do red meat. So, uh, yes, you have to get me a piece of beef. So I heard that and didn't take it too seriously. But uh, those of you women who've been pregnant before, you may know that at some point in that experience, you develop some kind of crazy urge. And then she got on my case, I had to get out of the house that Sunday morning, drove all around town looking for a place that was open that sold beef to get a pound of beef to take it home so that <laughs> she could get rid of that urge. <laughs> wow, well, but that mango is all I need today. The mango. All right, let's get to the word. Let's get to the word. Eight laws of health. Eight laws of health. You familiar with those? The acronym New start, nutrition, watch what you eat, exercise, water. How many glasses they tell us? Mm. Sunlight, temperance. T is for temperance. Then air, rest, and then number eight, the last T, trust in God. Trust in God. Since I'm not a health professional, I'm going to stick with law number eight today. and focus on our trust in God. There's a preacher who had a little cat. One day couldn't find the cat. He looked all around. The cat was not in the house. That's a story. He found a cat uh, way up at the top of a little tree. The tree was so slender, he could not climb. He tried all his best to woo the kitten down. The cat would not come down. So he came up with this fabulous idea. Got a 
rope from the trunk of his car. He threw the end of the rope over the top of the tree and tied the rope to the bumper of his car, backed up until the tree was bent all the way down to his level. But as he was getting out of the car, the rope snapped. Tree swung back into place. And away went the cat. Disappeared. When well, looked all around and couldn't find the cat after some time, the preacher decided to pronounce a little benediction and prayed that God will be merciful to that cat and God's grace will rest on that cat. And he went home and forgot it. But a couple of days later, as the preacher was uh, down in the supermarket, there at the counter, he uh, stopped to chat with his neighbor, who was standing there at the supermarket counter uh, with him. And uh, he noticed that uh, the neighbor had some uh, cat food in her, in her basket. And uh, he'd known that neighbor for some time. That neighbor uh, was a cat hater. She hated cats. And so he could not, for the life of him, understand what was she doing with cat food in her basket. So he asked, I know that you hate cats so badly. What are you doing with cat food in your basket? So she said, well, pastor, you... <laughs> You won't believe this story, you know, but my daughter has been harassing me for, for months. She wanted a cat for a pet. And so she, on that day, was, was harassing me again. She wanted a cat for a pet. And so I told her that I will give her, I will get her a cat. When God, when God gives it to her. So the little girl walked out of the house, walked into the backyard, and mother said, you know, pastor, you won't believe it, but I, I, I saw it with my own eyes. Uh, she knelt there, and uh, she began to pray, God, I need this cat, and mother just told me that uh, that she will get the cat as soon as you, God, you, God, delivers it. You say that I should get it. And pastor, just as she was praying that prayer, from out of nowhere, a cat flew out of thin air into her arms. But today I want to talk about when to pray. When to pray. Go with me to James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. The Bible says, If anyone among you is in trouble, James chapter 5, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let him pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. 
And then verse 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So life is full of many difficult moments. There are good days and there are not so good days, bad days. We never know what to expect. Life is totally unpredictable. Anyone who has had an accident or has had a family member suddenly get sick, you can attest that life can change radically in just a matter of seconds. In addition, we know, or we know firsthand how sin can devastate and destroy our lives. Uh, some of us are living today with the consequences of wrong choices as well. But in this passage, James talks about four times that we should pray. And I want to unpack those quickly and, uh, and send you going. Uh, if you look at the text first, you will notice James uh, says in verse 13, Is any one of you in trouble? You should pray. Is anyone in trouble? Pray. And the word used here in the text for trouble refers to suffering of any kind. Just general trouble. Disappointment, persecution. When we are in trouble, we are told to look to God in prayer. Psalm 34, verses 4 through 6, the psalmist David says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Uh, they looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Verse 6, one of my favorites. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. When we're in a mess, we should pray. Pray. Pray for wisdom, pray for strength, and for the removal of whatever is causing us to suffer. Pray. We have the privilege of prayer where we can go to God at any time, in any situation, and whatever is causing us a problem, we can talk to God about it. That's why I don't understand why some people go through life or attempt to go through life without a relationship with God. It's amazing how many bad things happen to us. And often we, we have no control uh, and uh, neither do we have any solutions. But in this passage we are going to look at this morning, James opens up in the text and he asks a simple question. Is any one of you in trouble? My guess is that some of you sitting right now looking at me, you are, you are experiencing some kind of stuff. Even right now, in tough times, James says, go to God in prayer. So the Bible is clear that suffering is a normal expectation for every believer. It is uh, not just for uh, non-believers. Good Christians have problems and face trouble as well. Peter in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, expresses it this way. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. So even good Christians have problems and, and see trouble. Even though we know life is never easy, we can... We can give way to self-pity or get resentful. Uh, we can get discouraged. When we sense that the pressures of life are greater than we can bear, James tells us to turn to God in prayer. 
So this lady got out of work one day and went to the pharmacy and to get some uh, medication. Uh, you know, she got out that night. She found herself alone in the parking lot. Got to her car, and the car was locked, and she was looking for her keys everywhere. Keys were where? Locked in the car. I've been there before. Keys locked in the car. Oh my dear, what a thing. Lady alone in a parking lot at night, keys locked in the car. So uh, she began to think, she began to think. She said, well, you know, uh, I think some time ago, I heard that uh, you can use a coat hanger to uh, break into the car. So maybe, let me look around, let me see what I can find. Good God Almighty, you know these stories. Just what she was looking for, she found the coat hanger, oh, bent up and broken up there in the corner of the parking lot. She took it up and uh, went back to the car, but wait, I, I have no clue what to do with this. I don't know. So she began to pray that God will somehow work this out for her. And as she was praying, up came this funny-looking guy riding a motorcycle. Got a little closer and she observed, but this guy looks downright scary. But he rides right up to her and he asked, what's the problem? She said, well, I locked my key in the car. I heard that you can use a coat hanger to open, but I, I got this coat hanger in the parking lot over there, but I, I don't know what to do with it to get into the car. Funny looking guy says, uh, let me have it. He takes the coat hanger in a matter of a couple of seconds, he did a couple of things and pop, car door was, was opened and oh, the woman was so elated, story says. She just hugged the funny looking man and began to thank him. She says, thank you so much. You are such a nice man. Such a nice man. The man looked at her and said, lady, you don't know me. I'm not a nice man. I just got out of prison for car, car theft. And she heard that and she hugged him a little tighter and she said, God, thank you for sending me a professional. <laughs> you see, when you are in trouble, James says, pray. Pray. God has a way of getting us out of trouble. And not some of the ways we think sometimes, but God. So James says, is anyone in trouble? As a question, pray. One, number two. <laughs> number two. Notice that James goes on to say, when you have success, you should also pray. Look at the text. Look at the text carefully. You'll notice that James continues. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. You see, James is saying here that not everyone goes through trouble at the same time. God has a way of balancing our lives, you see. And uh, in my life, I don't know about your life, but in my life, trouble comes uh, not just in single file, not just one. When I'm getting my dose of trouble, it, it sort of comes, you know, in a, in a dose of trouble, you know, not just... Uh, one pint of trouble. I, I, I would get gallons of trouble. One after the other. You have nice smooth lives. Your life's not like mine. Yeah. James says, is anyone in trouble? Pray. But he also says, pray when things are successful. 
You see, we will all have good days and bad days. The key is to make sure to remember God even on the good days. Even on the good days. The word happy means to be of good cheer and suggests a state of mind that is free from trouble. It is easy to pray when you are going through trials. When things are not going right and your back's up against the wall, that's when you need to hear from God. That's when you're going to pray in the morning and you're going to pray in the midday hour. We're going to pray at night. God, 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 please. But when life is smooth and easy, what happens? And you, and, and, and you are succeeding and everything is happening and things are moving fine and the money is flowing in and you can pay the bills. And, oh! You see, when we are happy, we need also to stay fervent in prayer. James warns us about that in the text. Because often, our faith is tested more by our successes than by our suffering. Process that. Think about King Hezekiah. Remember him? King Hezekiah. He was tested. There are at least three different ways that I can tell you God tested him. The king of Assyria came uh, to lay siege on the city of Jerusalem. The king sent Hezekiah a letter. Said to Hezekiah, that God you like to talk about, he's not going to save you this time. I am going to take your city from you. Hezekiah did not panic. The Bible says Hezekiah called a prayer meeting. He called a prayer meeting. Pastor Isaiah came in and spent some time with Hezekiah. They had a prayer meeting. And guess what? The Bible says at the end of the prayer meeting, God answered and some 185,000 enemy soldiers were killed by an angel. Yeah, you're right, Brownie. Amen. The king uh, returned to Assyria in disgrace. And the story says there that his sons killed him eventually while he was in the temple. That was number one. Number two. After the Assyrians had been demolished, Hezekiah became sick. Got sick, sick, sick. Hezekiah was told that his sickness would lead to death. And the Bible says Hezekiah cried, he cried, he cried, God, please, God, please. Guess what? God heard and God gave Hezekiah 15 more years. 15 more years. Yes. So, that wasn't all. Hezekiah saw the Assyrians. He saw what happened to him with his health. Bible says Hezekiah went on to live. He became very successful. He got rich, filthy rich. And then one day the ambassadors from Babylon came to visit him. They wanted to see, well, what was going on with Hezekiah? Why are all these fabulous things happening to Hezekiah and they're not happening to us? They wanted to see what, what, was, what was going on. They came up there to visit with Hezekiah and the Bible says that Hezekiah welcomed the envoy from Babylon 
and began to show them around. He began to show them around. Instead of telling them, well, well, you know, there is a person out there that, that I believe is responsible for all of my success. He's the one that healed me of my sickness. He's the one that actually killed the Assyrians. Instead of pointing the Babylonians to the God of heaven, Hezekiah took credit for his success. He showed them all his kingdom, and the Bible says he boasted about his accomplishments. Well, you know, I, uh, you know, I went down to the gym and uh, every morning, and uh, I was pumping all the weights. I, I, I ate all these fruits and vegetables, and oh yeah, and uh, now I'm healthy and I'm well, and uh, you know, I, I did this and I did that, and. Here is what I did, and here is what Hezekiah just boasted and boasted and boasted. And the Bible says that God's judgment on Hezekiah was swift. Isaiah chapter 39, verse 5. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. You see, because he did not give God the glory, he lost everything. His own success destroyed him, you may say. Let me tell you, my brothers and my sisters, when you're in trouble, pray. But when things are going good with you, don't forget to pray. There is somebody who is blessing you, uh, and don't think that, 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 that all of your achievements are as a result of your good management. It was in 1928 a meeting of the world's most successful financiers were, was held uh, in, uh, in a hotel in Chicago. And uh, around the table were some real big shots. The, the president of the largest uh, steel company at the time was at the table. Uh, the greatest uh, wheat speculator was there. Uh, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, sitting across the table. A member of the president's cabinet was there. Uh, one of the greatest investors from Wall Street was sitting on the other side of the table. The president of the Bank of International Settlement, sitting there. The head of the, world greatest, the world's greatest monopoly, sitting there. Big, 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 big shots. And the story says that collectively, in that room, these tycoons controlled more wealth than there was in the U.S. Treasury at the time. And for years, newspapers and magazines, the media had been printing and telling stories of the success of these men. Uh, uh, but listen to this, 25 years after that meeting, that notorious meeting, a reporter followed up on that meeting uh, wanted to know whatever happened to these men who were in that room that day. The president of the largest international independent steel company, Charles Schwab, you know the name? Charles Schwab lived on borrowed money the last five years of his life and died broke. The greatest wheat speculator, Arthur Cotton, he died broke. The president of the New York Stock Exchange, Richard Whitney, he was serving a term in Sing Sing prison. The member of the president's cabinet, Albert Fall, was pardoned from prison 25 years after, only 25 years. He was given a pardon so he can die at home instead of being 
dying in jail. And that Wall Street investor, Jesse Livermore, his name, he committed suicide. As a matter of fact, uh, the other two guys who were in the room as well, both committed suicide. When you are in trouble, pray. When times are fine, pray. Because that success may well be your biggest test. Then James says this. James says this. When you have sickness, when you have sickness, look at verses 14 and 15. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church and do what? Pray, to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. That's what James says. When you are sick, pray, pray. Isaiah 53 and verse 4, the Bible says, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Verse 5, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And that word infirmities in the text means griefs. In the King James, you see the word griefs. When you are grieving, pray, pray. When you are sick, pray. So in the context of the passage, Jesus took on our sins when he was on the cross. It, ta it takes a, uh, about, it, it, uh, it talks. Let me take that again. It talks about our griefs, our sorrows, our transgressions or iniquities, and then says we are healed. The New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24 says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds we have been healed. That's 1 Peter 2. Healing here is again linked to Jesus' dealing with sin on the cross. Uh, you see, what I'm getting at is, is this, and I, I, I don't have the time to unpack all of that, but what I'm getting at is this. You see, ultimately, all sickness is as a result of sin. All sickness is as a result of sin. Original sin. Original sin. You see... Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we live in a fallen world and our bodies are subject to decay. The moment we are born, we begin, we begin to die. We begin to die. These bodies are not going to last. And there is something self-destructive in all of us. Given time, we will all decay and die. Sin. The wages of sin is death. But through the cross, Jesus brings healing. That healing comes in maybe one of three ways. When Jesus heals us, he heals us first, I suggest, from sickness. From the sickness. From the sickness. You see, we can pray and God can hear that prayer. And sometimes God will choose to miraculously heal us from a sickness. You think God can do that? Yes, he can. Do you think God has done that? Yes, he has. Do you think God will continue to do that? Yes, he will. God can heal us from our sickness. I believe in miraculous healing. I have seen it a time or two. I believe it is important to pray 
for healing. That's why uh, when asked to pray uh, for the sick, uh, there it, is, it, is, it is not recommended, not by me at least, uh, to pray, well, God, you know, um, uh, whatever you want to do, uh, God, it's, it's your thing. And I, I think we can go to God boldly and we can ask God for what we want. We can ask God to heal us, and God has done that. God will continue to do that, and we can ask for specific healing. So God can heal us from the sickness. God can heal us, I like to say, through the sickness. What do I mean by that? You see, sometimes God will heal us in an instant, but often God will allow a doctor or some medication or maybe our own bodies to heal itself over time. God has done that. That's what I mean when I say through the sickness. Our bodies are amazing things, you know. God has created us with an amazing ability and power to regenerate ourselves. So God can heal us from the sickness. God can heal us through the sickness. But sometimes God would have to heal us by the sickness. I mean, that God ultimately brings healing by calling us home to be with him. You see, we all die. Even people who are miraculously healed from an illness at some point will one day die. Death is God's ultimate healing. One day we will have, uh, we who have received Christ will be called home to heaven and we will be fully healed when we get our new bodies. We read in the scripture reading today from the Revelation. Until then, the grace of God is sufficient. Yes, we should pray and expect God to do the miraculous. But trust in God to ultimately do what is best in our lives. So James says... We are to call the elders, anoint with oil, and uh, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Just a comment on the oil, maybe. You see, oil in the Bible was often used as a symbol for health and vitality. It was used as a visible symbol of God's presence. The oil, therefore, when we pray using oil, you see... Uh, by anointing with that oil, we are giving a, the sick person a reminder that all healing must come from God. It builds faith and says to the sick person, God is here and he is able to heal you. The power is not in the elders. The power is not in the oil. Uh, the power is not even in your faith. The power is in the person, God himself. The power resides there. So the fourth and final thing James says in the text, in verse 16, verses 15 and 16, last part he says, if you have sinned, if you have sinned, you will be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. David, after committing some pretty bad sins, started to feel the effects in his body. And watch this carefully. Listen to how David describes the link between his walk with God and his physical health. So you didn't know there was a link. There is. Watch this. Psalm chapter 32, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. When I kept silent, David speaking, when I kept silent, 
my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. Woo! So it is extremely important that we confess our sins to God and our faults to each other. Sin can work its way into our bodies, causing us to feel like we are wasting away. So I say to you again, all sickness is the result of sin. It is important to understand that sickness is not always the result of a particular sin. For most sickness is, is just maybe the natural result of living a fallen life in a sinful world. But we need to pray for forgiveness whenever we blow it. Understand that God does not punish your sin by striking you with some kind of disease in your life. But when you sin, pray. When you wrong your brother, ask for forgiveness. Because it will haunt you as a monkey on your back. You go to bed at night and you can't sleep because what? You know you should have said sorry. And before you know it, you have ulcers. Hmm? And you can say, you know, some people keep enemies 40 years. So you hit the fellow down the block and Year after year. But it's going to get you. So James says, when you have sinned, pray. And you do not need to be an expert in praying to pray. No matter who you are, you can pray. You can pray. Just three, four words of advice and I'm done. Pray aggressively. Pray aggressively because God can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Two, pray fervently because the fervent prayer of a righteous person, that's right, the New International says it's powerful and it's effective. Three, pray submissively. Because God understands. God understands your situation. God understands. Pray specifically and boldly. But remember that prayer is a request. It's not an order. So the text today. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If you have sinned, he will forgive you. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I want to take my seat, but before I do, somebody needs prayer today. and We want to pray before we go. Because somebody is sick. Somebody is sick. And you've been going to the doctor. You've been going to the doctor. Doctor has given you some medication. You've taken that. It hasn't worked. Hmm? So you've gone to the next doctor. He's given you some more medication. You tried that. Didn't work either. You're still sick. You're still sick. 
I'm going to submit to you today, my brothers and my sisters, that there is a relationship between your spiritual life and your health. And some of those things, some of those things that we harbor in our hearts, in our minds, some of these little things, like James says, it, it can be maybe just uh, harboring some hatred against somebody. And it's, it's, it's going to affect you physically. It will. James says, pray. Ask God. Ask God to help you to give up whatever you need to give up. Clear your mind. Clear your heart. Clear your spirit. Get all that stuff out. If there's somebody you need to say, man, I, I haven't spoken to you in 20 years, but, you know, let's forget this. Let's bury it. I forgive you. Huh? It works. It works. Bow your hands. Let us pray. Gracious God, you sent us a word today, and before we go, we just want to take a minute just to talk to you through our prayer. Just want to lift up the congregation before you today, God, and ask that you would help us to sort ourselves out because many of us are sick. We need healing. So God, through your Holy Spirit, please reveal to us our inner selves Then give us the power and the willingness to make those decisions we need to make. Forgive us of all our, of all our sins. God, if there's something today that we need to pray for, if there's someone in the house today that needs special prayer and attention God we believe that you know us all you know us better than we know ourselves so I will ask God that you minister to each of us today and minister to every single need and as we leave church and go home and we process this message today God help us to just make those decisions we need to make and fix us we pray but we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen and amen. 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 I think we're going to do that closing hymn, the number. Uh, you're coming. Amen.